Hello there, listener. Welcome to the Productivity Show. My name is Tam Pham, founder and CEO of Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and in life. And today I'm joined by my co-host, Brooks Duncan. How are you today, Brooks? I'm great. I like the way you said that. Uh, listener versus listeners. We're like focusing in on the individual, each individual listener today, <laughs> uh, sharing our productivity apps. And I, I love these type of episodes, as Tan knows. Um, I'm always, uh, I'm always pushing for the tech- techie episodes and the app episodes. Uh, those are my favorite ones to do. Uh, so really excited about today. Yeah, we're going to be talking about apps, and these are going to be apps that are going to be slightly different than what you usually hear us talk about, so I'm really excited to share those with you here today. And uh, before we start diving into that, uh, one of the things we always like to do is share some of our favorite resources as of lately. So, Brooks, uh, what is the top three for this episode? All right. The first resource I would like to share is definitely not a productivity app. It's a book, uh, and it's called The River of Doubt. Theodore Roosevelt's Darkest Journey. It's by Candace Millard. And it's basically about how he, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, if you don't know, he was president of the United States for two terms and he tried to make a third term, which he did not make. Uh, And after that, after that defeat, he went on a journey down to South America to try to discover a river uh, offshoot of the Amazon, which was called the River of Doubt, uh, which was later renamed, spoiler alert, to Roosevelt River. And uh, it's just this amazing book about his journey and the hardships they went through. It's the sort of thing that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, And so I really enjoyed the audio book of that. It was recommended by Ryan Holiday, author of the obstacle is the way. So if you like these type of books, The River of Doubt, that's number one. Number two, something completely different is Apple AirTags. And if you're not in the Apple ecosystem, Tile is another great uh, alternative. And they are these things that you put on or stick on or carry these little tags or cards uh, or um or or little devices that you carry with you. And it helps you locate things that you lost. And I actually had an experience of this with my son's wallet, uh, trying to find his wallet that he being a 16 year old left on the train here locally. Uh, So that, and uh, we had ended up finding it. So uh, these type of devices, whether it's Apple AirTags or Tile, really, really handy. And number three is a book called Nonviolent Communication. Uh, And this is a framework for having tough conversations with people uh, and, but it, allows you to do it in a way that comes across as welcoming feedback. We all communicate with others, whether in our job or in our personal life, and nonviolent communication gives you a great framework for doing that. Uh, So definitely check that book out as well. And those are the three resources that you can find out more about at theproductivityshow.com forward slash 373. Awesome. Thank you, Brooks. And uh, if you're listening to this episode right now and you're wondering, you know, Tan, Brooks, like there's so many productivity apps out there. How do you know what to use? Well, we have six of you, six of the episodes or six of the apps, I should say, that we absolutely love. And if you've been listening to our episodes for a while, you probably already know which apps we recommend. But today's episode is going to be different in the sense that we're going to be highlighting some of the ones that we don't frequently talk about. And uh, you might also be thinking, you know what? There's so many apps that are free. Uh, but some of you also worry the fact that they are free and how they make money and like, you know, how some require an investment, like, how do you know which one is worth paying for, right? And which ones you should use, even if they are free. And uh, I know many of you are also curious about what apps we are using these days. So we want to combine all of these things and put it in today's episode. And uh, before we start diving in here, I know many of you are always wondering what is coming up next week. Well, next week, we're going to be talking about how to recover from a bad day. So if you're feeling stuck, if you're sometimes feeling like, oh my gosh, like my day is just lost, you know, like there's nothing I can do about it. Well, there are some things you can do about that. There are ways to turn things around and we're going to be talking about that next week. So hope you uh, stick around and uh, check out next week's episode as well. So uh, Brooks, before we start diving into uh, the content here and share some of our favorite apps, would you mind kind of like setting it up and introducing every listener here to what we're going to be doing next? Yeah. So whenever we do these type of episodes, we always have usually some rules, some internal rules as because we usually do these draft style where we each pick uh, 
we each pick an app or apps that we like or tool. And, uh, and this episode was no different. And we always have internal rules about that. So basically what we do is we, we each picked three apps that we're loving lately. It could be for desktop computer, it could be mobile web. Um, when possible, we like to choose cross platform apps. Sometimes that's not possible. So when we do that, we will always try and list alternatives on other platforms. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what the app does, what we like about it, and maybe the general price range, if that's applicable. Uh, and we also have a rule that we're not going to recommend an app that is sponsoring this particular episode because we love having apps sponsor the product TV show, but none of the ones we pick are sponsoring this episode. And we also decided to put a rule in this time that some apps are off limits and they're off limits, not because we don't like them, uh, but more because we like them a little too much. And maybe we talk about them a lot. So we, so we wanted to go a little different this episode. So some of the examples of off limit apps are like OmniFocus, Dropbox, Evernote, 1Password, Calm, uh, Ulysses, Envialt, Text Expander, Hazel, <laughs> kind of like that's like rogues gallery of apps that uh, that we that we like to talk about a lot, and we wanted to make sure to choose different apps than those. Uh, now, one thing I do want to say about the, this episode is that, and Ten and I were just talking about this before we hit record, and that is that it's a reminder that. While we love talking about apps, uh, like I said, these are my favorite types of episodes to do. Really, an app is not alone anyway, is not going to fix a bad process or a habit. And really, the T framework, which we've talked about multiple times on the productivity show, is more important than apps. So if you're having productivity issues, start by focusing on your time, your energy, your attention, all the things we talked about most recently in TPS 275, uh, where we talked about the T framework. Um, and those are really where you should start. The right app can definitely make you more productive by making you more efficient, more effective, and reducing friction. Uh, but really, the biggest leverage you have is going to be on kind of going behind the app and using the T framework as a guide for you. All right, Brooks, uh, let's uh, kick it off here. And uh, I'll go first. So my number one pick here, and this is not in any particular order, it's just in the sense that we're releasing our first app here. And that doesn't mean that it's my favorite app, but it's just the one that I will mention first. And that is an app that I surprisingly use so much and heavily rely on without me even realizing it. And it wasn't until I had to sit down and think about, oh my gosh, like what are some of the apps that I use most frequently? And this is the one that came up to the top very quickly. So that is Grammarly. So Grammarly did sponsor us in the past, but this episode is not sponsored by them. So I want to make that very clear that this is not a sponsored recommendation. Uh, I, I feel like nowadays with a lot of influencers and what you see online, you have to make it very clear what is sponsored and what is not. And you'll notice right away, we try to be very transparent with that. And so if you're unfamiliar with Grammarly, so Grammarly is an app that is available on Mac, Windows, uh, on Chrome, Android, iOS, as in keyboard. And what it does, it will find misspellings and also suggest grammar tweaks to your writing. Whether you are writing in a browser, in an email, uh, on, on their online app, like there's just so many places where Grammarly can be kind of like hovering and checking your spelling and, and grammar. And if you're someone like me who sits behind a, behind a computer quite a bit and does a lot of writing, whether it's emails, uh, blog posts, or newsletters, or just like, you know, setting up documents and such, uh, you'll find that uh, this little tool or a little app comes in so handy because it makes all these different suggestions of how you can, you know, make your sentences more succinct. You can find ways to uh, make a sentence sound more clear, and it makes all these different suggestions for that. So it's a free app. Um, it will have all the basic functionality you you will need. You can always upgrade to like a more premium version for about 12 bucks a month, which basically gives you more uh, suggestions of how to make things a little bit better or sound better. And uh, I would say for most people, you probably don't have to upgrade. You can get a bit, you can get by with a free plan just fine. And so uh, what's funny is I actually discovered this app through the original sponsorship that they did for our podcast. That's how I actually originally found out about them. And so um, one of the things we're always very conscious of is, you know, when we get approached 
by all these different companies. Uh, we want to make sure that we always recommend some of the one that we personally use and personally like. And uh, you have no idea how many you know sponsors we get uh, pitched to us like every single week. Like there's just so many. So Brooks does a good job of filtering all of that. So all kudos goes to him. And that's how I originally found out about it. And I'm glad they did sponsor us in the past because now I use it all the time. Yeah, Grammarly is great. And I've actually been a subscriber of Grammarly Premium for many, many years. Even when uh, even when they did sponsor us, I already had a paid plan. So uh, so uh, I, I felt really excited about, to, about giving that recommendation. And the thing I like about it, um, just like you said, the, the spelling and the grammar tweaks and stuff like that, that's all great. One thing I do like about the, the premium version is that it, it kind of goes beyond that in the sense that it will tell you how to make writing more concise. It will tell you, you know, yeah, you don't really need these words or, you know, maybe you should rephrase it this way. Uh, it also will tell you like the mood of your writing. So if you are writing a, a serious email, let's just say, uh, it will, it, and it, and it, tells you it has it does this by emojis which of course i like uh it will if it has like the funny emoji you know okay this or vice versa i've got the tone wrong for what it is i'm trying to do uh so i really like uh yeah how grammarly does those suggestions and does it in a way that like legitimately makes your writing better versus just improving your spelling, which is of course helpful, uh, helpful as well. So yeah, hundred percent. Uh, I'm with you on Grammarly. Yeah. You don't have to be a full-time writer or anything to use this. Uh, I'm not a full-time writer. Brooks is definitely not a full-time writer. We don't consider ourselves ourselves writers whatsoever. And we are big fans of this app. So definitely recommend you check it out. And again, everything that we mentioned right now is in the show notes. So you can always go to theproductivityshow.com slash 373. All right. I will do my first recommendation then. And my first recommendation is an app called Libby. So L-I-B-B-Y. And that is available on Android, iOS, on the web, uh, or where I tend to use it the most is it also has a Android auto and CarPlay app. And what this lets you do is it lets you read eBooks and listen to audiobooks totally for free because you do it with your library card. So if you're somebody who reads a lot or wants to read a lot, or you want to, uh, you want to listen to audiobooks, but you find maybe an audible ex uh, subscription quite expensive, um, Libby can solve all that. If your library, your, your local library participates in it, of course, uh, which most do these days, I think at least in North America, I believe worldwide as well. But basically what you can do is go to your library's website or in the Libby app itself, search for the book that you're looking for, the audiobook. And then if the ebook or audiobook is available, you can use the Libby app to through your library card to download it. And then you have it free for a certain period of time. And, and that period of time is always more than enough for me. Uh, and so, yeah, when I'm, when I'm in the car, I'm always listening to an audiobook. I've said that before. Uh, I do have an Audible subscription, but when it's available, the book I want is available in, uh, in, uh, Libby, I will always go for that first because, you know, why <laughs> if it's available for free through Libby. Why would I use one of my credits uh, for that? So uh, the most recent book that I read, uh, audio book I read through Libby was Manifesto for a Moral Revolution by Jacqueline Novogratz. Uh, and I just, I'm just starting yesterday, uh, Waking Up by Sam Harris, which is one of those books that I've always heard references. So I decided to try it out. And that's all through Libby and all through free. Uh, I believe it supports magazines as well, uh, but I've never used it for that, but I, but I heard that it is. And again, it's not just audiobooks. You can read eBooks uh, on your tablet or computer or uh, other device or your phone uh, using Libby as well. So yeah, that's my, my first recommendation is a free eBook and audiobook reader. I know you're a big fan of this because uh, I've heard you talk about this app uh, many times and uh... So Brooks, what would you say to someone who already is a subscriber to say Audible? Um, would you convince them to switch over to, to Libby? Uh, it depends how much you read. Um, for me, I found I find it worthwhile to keep a my Audible subscription because uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I just tend to read and listen to audiobooks a lot. Uh, so um, I like the ability to find things in both places. And also the um 
not everything is available through Libby. Uh, so your, your ability to find things is going to be more in Amazon or Nook or whatever other platforms you use for eBooks and audiobooks. Uh, they're going to have more than Libby does. It really depends on your library card. Uh, and also if you, uh, there's kind of false scarcity through, uh, through getting books and audiobooks through your library as well, in that um, even though it's, it's bits, so technically it could be unlimited, uh, there's almost always limits on how many people at a time can check out an audiobook or an ebook. So you might find that the book that you want is not available through Libby, in which case then I switch over to Amazon. If you're a more... Um, if you're a more infrequent reader, I guess I would say, uh, then maybe you can get away with just using Libby. I have friends that, that do that. They don't subscribe to anything. They just do it all through Libby and they're, um, they're perfectly happy. So it depends on how much you read, I'm going to say. All right. Before we start moving on to our second round of recommendations here, I want to give a quick shout out to all of our TPS Plus subscribers and listeners. So we have a premium version of the podcast called TPS Plus or the Productivity Show Plus. And you can find more information about that at theproductivityshow.com slash plus. And you can think of it as like an upgraded version of the podcast where you get episodes ad free. So there are no ads in there. You get them a week early. Plus, you get some bonus content as well when you sign up and become a subscriber. And it's also another way for you to support our work and the Productivity Show as well. And if you become an annual subscriber, which many people do, you also get an exclusive T-shirt that says one tweak a week. So if you ever see someone with that T-shirt at the airport, you know that they're a TPS Plus subscriber. So uh, they wear them loud and proud. And I want to thank everyone who has signed up already so far. So thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you who are listening or interested in getting more exclusive content from us, you know, behind the scenes stuff, bonus content, uh, be sure to check out TPS Plus. Again, you can go to theproductivityshow.com slash plus. All right, let's move on to my second recommendation here. And this is an app called Air Alo. So it's Air Alo. And uh, it's available on, on iOS and Android. And what it does, it, it gives you a virtual SIM card on your phone. So if you have a modern phone that maybe has been released in the last two years or so, it probably has a feature called eSIM or electronic SIM. And what it does is it allows your phone to have essentially two SIM cards, one physical SIM card and one electronic SIM card as well. And so with the app Air Alo, what you can do is you can actually buy virtual SIM cards on your phone and buy cheap data plans that way. So for example, this past trip when I was in Europe, not too long ago, about four or five weeks ago, uh, I tried it out uh, again. Uh, I tried it in the past and I had like an okay experience and I tried it out again this time. Um, and I had a great experience because I, it saves me so much money. So to give you an idea, I was in the Netherlands and uh, I was looking for ways to get a data plan. So I could go to my existing carrier, which is T-Mobile, and I could pay, let's say $35 for uh, five gigabytes of data for 10 days, okay? So $35 for five gigabytes. And, uh, you know, on the first glance, I was like, okay, I guess that's what I'm gonna have to pay if I'm abroad, right? And even though you get free internet on your T-Mobile plan when you're abroad, it's like 2G, it's like edge speed. So it's really slow. There's really not that much that you can do with that. And so it's worth upgrading every time I go. However, if I get the same plan, in Air Alo, so I bought like uh, a plan through like a local telecom company while I was there through the app. It was only fifteen dollars, so I saved myself twenty dollars for the same amount of data. And um, and when I went through other countries, I would basically do the same thing again, and it would save me so much more money. And so I would recommend if you are traveling quite a bit and you have to go through lots of international travel, instead of you know buying local SIM cards where you have to pull it out of your existing phone, put a new one in, you might have to find a convenience store, right? Where you buy a SIM card and so on. Download this app Air Alo and then have it done essentially on your phone. So the cool benefit of this as well is that you can still keep your existing number live, right? So you still have your US number uh, that is still working. People can still call you on that, but you use the data plan of the virtual SIM card. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. 
Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Um, I've, I've never done the eSIM before. I've only done the old school way where you arrive in a country and you go find, you have to go find some kiosk or some maybe sketchy looking store and uh, try to figure out what you want and try to explain what you want. And then you have to pop your SIM out and put in a, some, uh, some other SIM. And uh, so this gets away with that at all. You keep your normal SIM in there and you don't have to do anything. That is, yeah, this is so awesome. Uh, and the thing I like about it, the concept is, you know, the, the money part is great too, but I think for me, it's the, the time savings. Like the last thing you want to be doing when you get off a plane is going to have to find a SIM card. But a lot of times that is the first thing uh, we end up doing. I, I've done that in Italy. I did it in Russia and uh, it just can take a lot of time. Uh, and this totally, totally gets rid of that. So for me, it's the time savings. That's the, that's the big thing. I, I wish I can think of some situations where I, I really, really wish I had this on previous trips. So uh, next time I am able to travel somewhere from Canada, uh, I'm definitely going to use this. Yeah. I love it for the time savings, right? Um, because when was the last time you carried that little thing that allows you to you know, pull out your SIM card? right? Like you have to have this like little thing carried with you somewhere <laughs> that's so easy to lose, right? And so uh, this is just so much more convenient. So I highly recommend this if you are someone who travels quite a bit. Um, even if you travel just once a year, I think it's still worth just getting this app. So Air Alo, the way you spell it is A-I-R-A-L-O. So A-I-R- ALO, Air ALOs. Again, available on iOS and Android. The app itself is free, but you can purchase the data plan within the app itself. And so it's really easy to use that way. Uh, pretty frictionless and uh, highly recommended if you are a frequent traveler. This, uh, your, this app recommendation is getting a lot of love in the live stream, which you record, which we have alongside these recordings, like you said, for Dojo and TPS Plus members. Uh, Kimberly says she's saved it in her travel collection. Neil Tara says that's exactly what she needs in a few months ago when she starts traveling again. Uh, Giacomo says uh, you can always use a paper clip to open the SIM card. Yeah, that's what I used to do. I used to always travel with a paper clip because I would always be changing my SIMs. But I, 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 feel, like, uh, I feel like this is just so much better. So uh, Aralo is definitely better than a paper clip. <laughs> uh, all right, so I will do my next app recommendation, and this is a Windows app and a Mac app, uh, and it's one I use every single day, uh, and it is called Snagit. And what Snagit lets you do is lets you capture and use images and videos to share ideas, give feedback, uh, and communicate with other people visually. And this is kind of a weird app recommendation in the sense that there are like a million free ways to do screen capture, to take screenshots, to take videos. And not only that, but it's built into both Mac and Windows, uh, this feature. And especially the Mac one is actually really, really good now. Uh, so, you know, why bother using a, a standalone app, let alone, let alone one you have to pay for? Well, the things I like about it is... First of all, it's cross-platform, so you can use it on Windows and Mac. So for me, I'm switching back and forth between platforms quite a bit, and I like just having that consistent experience uh, doing the same thing uh, on Windows and Mac, and also I'm capturing things on both Windows and Mac a lot. Uh, the other thing I like about it is it can do everything in one app. You don't have to do like images in one app, record video in another app, and maybe like have a longer video recording app. Um, another thing I like about it is it can record a scrolling screen into an image. So if you're, uh, this is really, really handy for capturing web pages and stuff like that. Uh, anything that might be go longer than a single screen, uh, you can set it up. So you, you start the capture and then you scroll down or scroll across or whatever, and it saves it all to one single image. Um, it also has keyboard, like really good keyboard shortcuts. It can do advanced markup. It can take still images and make a video out of them. You can put steps in it, like one, two, three, if you're explaining steps, which is something that I do quite a bit. Uh, and you can capture and share to a bunch of different web services and locations and stuff like that. Uh, so this is an app that I use, like I said, every single day. Sometimes I just use it once or twice a day. Sometimes I'll use it 20 and 30 times a day. I went back through my history to look uh, in the, if I'm in the middle of a project and stuff like that. 
And it's just a, an app that, like I said, um, if you're somebody who just takes the occasional screenshot, it's not really worth it. You might as well just uh, use the, what's built into your operating system, which works great. Um, uh, and preview on the Mac, for example, is really good for marking up images and that sort of thing. But if you're somebody who does this sort of thing on a regular basis, explain things to people, share feedback to people, that sort of thing. Um, having an app like this that you can kind of live in, uh, I found it really, really worthwhile. And I've used it since, I don't even know what, probably 2000 and 2005 or something like that. I've used this app for a very, very long time. Uh, the price uh, is $49.99 US, which sounds like a lot, especially for a screen capturing app, uh, but it is non-recurring. So it's a one-time purchase. It's not a subscription. Uh, and for me, it's completely worth it. Uh, you just have to decide if it's worth it for you. You know, I've been that person who has tried to get away with all the free solutions for the longest time. <laughs> so in the past, I even made recommendations of some of the free tools that do something very similar, right? But the problem with the free tools I have found is that uh, they all miss like one particular feature or something that makes it just a little simpler uh, or you miss like, oh, I wish I could annotate this or I wish I could make this a GIF or a GIF or I wish I could do X, Y, and Z. And I feel like Snagit has it all in one place. So coming from someone who's tried to do the free route where you just you get a bunch of different apps and do it all in the same, you know, in, in different apps put together. Yeah, you can do it, but I find that it still causes a lot of friction. So to give you an example, you know, Sketch is an example of an app where you can do like a screenshot, right? Which is built by Evernote. And then you can kind of annotate stuff, right? And quickly share stuff and, and so on, but it can't do video. Right. It, it, it does well with images or screenshots, but just not with video. And sometimes you need to kind of go back and forth or sometimes when you're communicating online, you want to have both. You want to have a screenshot and then something like an image or a video later. Right. And so th then you have to switch to a different tool. Right. Like I know Zapier has like a free recording tool that I've tried and like you end up with four or five different tools, whereas you can just actually have everything in one place, which is what Snagit would be. Right. So I actually recently upgraded to snag it myself and I got rid of all my free tools and I can say like, that. <laughs> I wish I had done that earlier. So coming from someone who's tried the free stuff, like, yeah, you can get away with it. And if you maybe use it like once every now and then, I guess that's fine. But if you're someone like me or Brooks, you need to do it every day or you are someone who works in a remote setting and you have to communicate through Slack or an online platform where you have to write comments and stuff like that using something like Snagit will make it so much easier. Even if you work in something like, you know, customer support or customer service, where you write a tons of emails, like having a video or having a animated GIF or an animated, you know, image uh, makes it so much easier to communicate a lot of different things in one short email. So uh, I highly endorse this, recommend this. Um, anyone who is working in a remote setting, you should definitely have this. I, I'm almost honestly thinking that this is, is one of those required apps if you join the company. It's, it's that useful. All right, episode 373, and I finally got tan onto the onto the Snagit tray, and I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, Kimberly in the live stream says that uh, reminded me of a great feature of Snagit. She's a Snagit fan as well that I totally forgot about, which is you can actually grab the text out of an image. So you can take a screenshot of something and then grab the text out of there. You can also go the opposite way. You know, sometimes you want to take a screenshot of something, especially for like a web page or something like that, and you just want to show like the structure of something. Thing, not necessarily the content. It has a simplified tool, which will just like block out uh, all the text and make it a simplified version. So yeah, it's a, it's a great tool. All right. So that was our second round of recommendations. So let's move on to the third one. And my recommendation for this one is an app called InShot. So I-N-S-H-O-T, InShot. It's available on iOS and Android. And what it does, it's basically a video editor with more features than your built-in editor that you have on your phone, whether it's iOS or Android. And it's, I would say, more geared and more friendly towards social media usage. So if you're someone who is a content creator, is an influencer, or someone who wants to make their Instagram or Facebook presence or whatever social media platform you use with video a little bit more fun or cute or, or a little bit more interactive, I would say 
using something like InShot is, is the tool you want to check out. So I like it because it's very easy to use. It has lots of features that are um, kind of like geared towards social media. So having like little transitions in place and so on. I like to think of it as like iMovie, but social media friendly. iMovie is very kind of like, you know, old school, where something like InShot is very new school. That's how I would kind of like compare it to. So um, it has, you know, all the features that you would want, transitions, uh, adding, you know, stickers on top of videos, um, like having gradient effects. Like there's just so many things you can do that uh, a normal editor would have, but with just additional features that makes it a little bit more geared for social media usage. So it's a free app. You can download it. It will come with watermarks and stuff like that, or you can upgrade and pay for something like that for a monthly fee or an annual fee. And once I use it for the first time, I kind of played around with it. I immediately upgraded to the annual plan, which is about $15 a year. So it's not too much. Uh, so if you're someone who creates a lot of content on their phone and posts a lot online, I would highly recommend you check out InShot. Yeah, it's funny. The the creation, ca capturing videos and editing videos and stuff like that, like if you don't do it very much, it's not a big deal. But if you are somebody who does it quite a bit, there's so much time and efficiency savings you can get from using a specialized tool for this that makes it makes it really fast. Like I always see these videos that people post and I'm like, thinking to myself, how do they do that? <laughs> Cause it's, it just looks kind of different somehow. Uh, so now I know InShot is one of the ways that they, that they did it. I wasn't familiar with that app. Uh, so that's great. Yeah. Giacomo in the, the live stream mentioned uh, Luma fusion, which is another video editing app. And that's one I used last year as well. Uh, it's definitely more of a Hollywood studio kind of like film editor, if that makes sense. And uh, it's very powerful. Like it can do so many different things. If you're someone who wants to make short films on their phones or iPad or something, like that's a great tool to use. But if you're someone who just wants to keep things relatively simple and friendly for social media, um, I would say InShot is like the way to go. So it just depends on your usage, right? So again, if you're a content creator, influencer, or someone who likes to post on social media a lot, like go check out InShot. All right, I'm gonna wrap up my final recommendation and I wanted to make sure to do a web app. Uh, so I decided to do it in a web app for web apps, which is Zapier. Now this is something we have talked about on the productivity show before, but it is one of my favorite apps that I use all the time. Uh, so I definitely wanted to, sh to share that one. And basically what it allows you to do is connect together different web services, which lets you integrate them and automate them in ways that otherwise wouldn't be possible. There's other similar tools. Uh, IFTTT is one, uh, but I think nowadays, this is my personal opinion, uh, Zapier has definitely left it in the dust as far as if you're using it for work or even personal stuff as well. Uh, Zapier is, unless you're only in the Microsoft ecosystem, in which case you would probably want to use Power Automate. Uh, but if you're if that's not the case, then I would definitely look at using Zapier. And so basically what you can do is you can just save so much time and so many errors without having to be able to code. That's the key thing. There's lots of ways to integrate things uh, online or on your computer, uh, but a lot of it involves coding. With Zapier, you don't need to know any code at all. All the building blocks are right there. You just need to put them together like Lego pieces. So you could have it so that if somebody fills out a form, uh, it will automatically add a row to Google Sheets and then maybe sends an alert in Slack or Microsoft Teams or something like that. You could have it so that attachments from Gmail are automatically saved to Dropbox. Maybe if you star the email or give it a certain label or just do it all the time, or you could do things like create follow-up tasks in Todoist from Google Calendar events, something like that. There's all sorts of ways to uh, th uh, of thousands of different apps you can connect together. Uh, and Zapier is kind of like the, the, the thing that brings it all together. It's actually a free web, web app uh, with a limited number of zaps, they call it. Every automation they call a zap. So a limited a number of uh, single step zaps uh, you can do with a free plan. Uh, but if you're willing to pay $19.99 a month and up for the starter plan, and you know there's higher plans, of course, um, you can do a lot of things like have more zaps available and also have multi-step zaps. And you can do some 
some really, if you go up to the pro plan, you can do some really complex and really powerful stuff. But even if you don't want to do that, even if you want to just use the, uh, the free plan to check it out, uh, you can still do a lot with Zapier. So that's one of my very favorite apps. Yeah, a lot of things that we do behind the scenes at Asian Efficiency is actually powered by Zapier. So uh, we love it. We use it. And uh, we have a lot of zaps <laughs> running in the background. A lot of them that I, I don't even know about. So I see stuff happening all the time. And I always wonder, is that, is that a zap? Is that a thing we built in Zapier? And usually it is. So if you're someone who loves to connect you know, their stuff and their information and platforms online, or whether you have a business or you just have a lot of different workflows and accounts online and you kind of want to integrate stuff together, like Zapier is a great way to do that. So I, I love this recommendation here. Uh, right. the, oh, sorry. I was just going to mention uh, in the live stream, uh, Kimberly recommends Indo Integrately, which is a, she says is an easier to use alternative if you want to check it out. So it has a free version with up to 6,000 uh, tasks. Uh, so if you, if you want to check that out, check out Integrately as well. I haven't used it personally, uh, but uh, that's one to check out. So we just wrapped it up here with six recommendations for you here today. And uh, I know that's a lot of recommendations already. And you might be really excited to move forward with them and go, hey, I'm going to install all six of them and use them. However, uh, we wouldn't be you know, Asian efficiency advisors if we didn't tell you to only do one thing at a time, right? So as the action step for this episode, I would recommend that you don't try to implement all of the app recommendations that we talked about, like pick just one that stood out most for you or that you think is most valuable for you and just start using that particular app, okay? And once you kind of get the hang of it, then you can always refer back to this episode and you can go check out the show notes, what the app recommendations were again. And so you won't lose track of them. But just pick one app and give it a try. Uh, some of them have free trials, so give that, a, give that a go. And if you're willing to upgrade and spend some money on it, you can do that as well. Um, and once you kind of get the hang of it, then move on to the next app. Okay. So next week's episode is all about how to recover from a bad day. And I hope to see you next week. And if you want to uh, find links to everything that we share in the show notes, you can go to theproductivityshow.com slash 373. So thank you again for joining us here today and we'll see you next productive Monday.